Good afternoon, or good evening. I'm not sure. I think the sun is set, right? I don't know. This is one of those transition periods. Um, my name is uh, Jasso Sorensen. Technically, that's not my name. My name is James Christopher Sorensen III. Jasso is my Amazon given name. So if you want to email me, email jasso at amazon.com. Um, I'm a senior principal engineer at Amazon. I've been with AWS for about 14 years. I was one of the original developers on S3 way back when. Um, I launched our IoT product. And for the last couple of years, I've been working on DynamoDB. And today, what I wanted to do was give a talk about, under the hood, kind of how Dynamo works. And the way I plan on approaching this is how we onboard engineers to the Dynamo team. So the first thing that an engineer, when they join Dynamo, has to do is interact with the API. They kind of take the role that you guys as customers have. You know, they uh, probably haven't used Dynamo, you know, especially like guys we hire out of college. We have them do things like make a table, um, create indexes, set up streams, a lot of the, you know, the, the uh, public-facing API of DynamoDB. And once they get done with that, we move on to what this talk is going to be, or the onboarding. So what are the goals of this talk? Well, one, hopefully you'll learn about some of the features of Dynamo and how they work. But I think the, the real goal, or that, and I hope you take away from this, is understanding how this tool works and can work better for you. And I think an analogy is kind of appropriate here. Um, you know, if Dynamo is a tool, and the, the analogy I think of is a car. Right? A car is a tool that you use to get to work. And if, if you start driving your car and you know nothing about a car, and you're driving down the road and the engine's going wee, right? screaming really loud, and, and you're going along with traffic, if you know nothing about cars, you'd think, hey, everything's fine and dandy. right? But the reality is you've probably shifted it into first gear, and you're streaming along, and that car is going to last you for maybe 5,000 miles total because you're going to wear it out. Now, you're not going to wear out DynamoDB, but clearly using the tool the way it's intended to be used can give you much better results. And so understanding how Dynamo works on the inside, I think, is, will let you more effectively use Dynamo. So the way we're going to do this is kind of walk through these five different uh, features of Dynamo. We're going to start with like, really the simplest and move on toward until we get to global tables. So we'll talk about how do you get an item and put an item talk about auto scaling and provision, how backup and restore works in Dynamo, and we'll talk a little bit about streams and wrap up with global tables. So when you get an item from Dynamo, you make a call and you come through the network. And Dynamo doesn't care whether you're coming from the public internet, whether you're coming from the EC2 network or a VPC, a virtual private cloud. We don't care how you get to DynamoDB. But when you get there, you land on a a process that we call the request router. And this is the public facing API for Dynamo. And the first thing the request router does is it authenticates the request. It makes sure that the caller is who they say they are. And this authentication system is common among um, all AWS components. We use the same, same subsystem for that. Um, the other thing the request router do, will do is make sure that you are authorized to do whatever you're doing or asking to do. So in this case, you're trying to get an item. And there would be some policy. In this case, I'm just showing a sample policy here that gives me permission to uh, get an item from, from Dynamo. This is, I just threw this up as an example. The details are not really important for this. But after we've uh, authenticated and authorized, the next thing that, that the request router will do is it makes a call out to our storage nodes. And this is where your actual data is stored. And the, the storage node will look up the piece of the data that you're asking for, the key, uh, get the data, associated data with it, send it back to the request router, and then on to uh, back to you. Pretty straightforward. A put gets to be a little bit more complicated. Um, the request router will talk to a storage node. And it'll tell it to uh, put this data. The storage node will store it locally. And it has, because we need to durably store your data, putting it on one server clearly uh, puts the data at risk. 
So what Dynamo does is it writes it to, tells two other storage nodes to store that data. And the, the reality of what Dynamo does is it waits for one other node to acknowledge it uh, to reduce latency. The third, the third node is usually really close behind, but we just have to get it to two nodes, and then we, the, request, the storage node will acknowledge to the request router, send, the, send you back the, uh, the results for the, for the put to say that we were successful. Now, I bet a lot of you have hopefully read the Dynamo paper. We published this paper, I don't know, it's about 11 years ago, 10 years ago, something like that, that talked about Dynamo. And the Dynamo that's explained in that paper uh, is not the same Dynamo that we use today. Um, Dynamo DB has evolved from Dynamo. And so in the Dynamo paper, we talk about uh, Quorum, and that's how Dynamo, Dynamo guaranteed correctness. Is we did Quorum puts, Quorum reads. Dynamo DB doesn't do that. And instead, we use something called Paxos. Well, so Paxos is this algorithm that Leslie Lamport uh, wrote this paper called The Part-Time Parliament a long, long time ago, in 1989, I guess it was. And this paper didn't get a lot of recognition or, or notice at the time. In 2001, he wrote the uh, follow-up paper called Paxos Made Simple. And I guess it was at that time that really people understood the, the power of the thing that he had proposed in this original paper. And what Paxos is, is a way of getting a bunch of distributed machines to, to all agree on a certain value, whatever that value is that you're trying to agree on. And in Dynamo's case, that thing that we're trying to get it to agree on is a leader. So Dynamo is running Paxos among the storage nodes to elect a leader for that partition or for your table. And so what happens when you do the put is the put is sent to the leader storage node. And the, there's, the leader is always up to date. Definitionally, to allow it to even become leader, you have to know that you have all the mutations up until that point. If you don't, you have to go to your, one of your peers get yourself caught up because um, you, you can't, you know, like when you're doing a put, a conditional put, you have to know that you have the correct value to compare the, the, the put to. So we elect the leader, and then again, we propagate that data out to uh, the peer storage nodes. Um, then what happens is that that leader is periodically heart beating. I think right now we heartbeat once every 1.5 seconds out to the storage nodes, to the peers. And if those peers miss some heartbeats, two heartbeats, three heartbeats, I should know that number exactly. Um, if they miss the heartbeats, what'll happen is that storage node will say, whoa, the leader's gone, and it will initiate a new election round and say, I would like to be leader now, I think the other guy is gone. And if his peers agree, he'll become the leader and take over the, the, uh, the leadership of the partition modulo him having been caught up to the, uh, with the most current rights. So as you might guess, Dynamo doesn't have one request router and three storage nodes. We have thousands of them, many thousands of them. And um, like any well-architected uh, AWS application, like we, you know, we give guidance to our customers to say, you need to be in multiple availability zones to have high availability. Well, Dynamo is no different. And we have these storage nodes in different availability zones. We have the request routers in different availability zones. So when you make this request, you'll hit some arbitrary request router. The request routers themselves are stateless. So it doesn't matter which one of those green boxes you land on to make your request. That request router then will make a call to the to the storage node that is the leader of the partition that you need to talk to, and then he'll talk in turn to other storage nodes in the other availability zones. This points out a, a, an extra piece of complexity in the system that we didn't talk about initially, and that is partition metadata. Somehow that request router, even though he's stateless, has to know which one of all those storage nodes is actually the leader for that partition. So we have this other piece of subsystem called the partition metadata service. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. 
The next thing I wanted to talk about is kind of how Dynamo sets up tables. Now this is pretty basic stuff for Dynamo, but I want to make sure that we're all on the same page. So when you make a table in Dynamo, you have to tell us a primary key, a primary hash key as a matter of fact. So in this example, we're, we have some data about some customers, where they live and who they are. If you really care, those are all the members of my family. My daughter is studying in London. Um, and, but what we, so we have, and we have a customer ID, and we're going to choose that customer ID to be the primary key, the primary hash key for this table. So the thing that Dynamo then does on, in, in the background is it computes a hash given that, that primary key. And what that hash function is, is we, you know, we don't publish it. It's arbitrary, but it is always the same hash function. We then take these hash values and sort the data essentially by these hash values. Now, this is really happening as the table is being built, but we'll sort them. And as you can see, we've par decided to partition this table into three partitions. So the first partition is going from hex value 0 to something like 0, 7, something, 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 and so on. The second partition is going from the 7 to, I don't know, maybe it uh, looks like something like C, I don't know. And then we have our third partition. We take these partitions, and now they have to get mapped out into the storage nodes. So again, we, pick a, we have to pick a storage node in each of the three availability zones. And then it's uh, up to those storage nodes in the availability zones to choose who's going to be the leader via the Paxos algorithm. This brings up a, a point or, or an opportunity to explain what eventual consistency means inside of Dynamo. And, you know, because puts, like I said, have to be consistent. We have to talk to the leader. But in Dynamo, you can, you can request uh, that Dynamo allows you to do an eventually consistent read. And the re way that happens and why it's eventually, con in eventually consistent is because we let the request router randomly choose any one of the three storage nodes that are hosting that partition. So if for whatever reason, this lower storage node has fallen a little bit behind, you may not get the most recent put to your data. Now, the odds of this are actually pretty low because, well, low is some definition of low, right? Because the leader we know is always up to date, and we know that one other storage node has to be up to date to, for us to acknowledge the put. So the odds that you're talking to a storage node that is, uh, doesn't have the latest data is at worst one in three. So most of the time, even with an eventually consistent read, two thirds of the time you will still get a consistent read, but you might not get the uh, most consistent read. And the thing about this is, well, usually the question then arises, well, how inconsistent is it? And that is part of the problem with eventual consistency is eventually that node will get caught up. I don't have an answer. And it can depend a lot on network traffic, how far behind it fell, um, you know, did it just recently get rebooted and it has a whole bunch of log to replay. I mean, so there are times where it can be quite a ways behind. But almost all the time, it's within milliseconds of the leader. The next thing I'd like to do is kind of dig into what happens inside these storage nodes. So the storage nodes have two data structures in them. There's a B plus tree or a B tree and the replication log. So the B tree is where we do all the query and uh, user interactions. So we have to put your item into the B tree. When we do a get, we, look in, we use the B tree's index to go find the item that you're looking for, or scans or queries. Those are all against the B tree. And then we have a replication log. And the replication log is recording every mutation that happens against that particular partition. So these are the, really the two internal data structures to a storage node. I mentioned our partition metadata service. Uh, Dynamo has this component we call it auto admin. And auto admin has many, many roles in Dynamo. One of its roles is to make sure that the partition metadata system is up to date. And it's always being updated with the location and who the leader is for a particular partition, or for actually for all partitions. Uh, Auto admin has another role, and that is 
partition repair. So when auto admin, is, he's monitoring, he, she, it, is monitoring all the components or all the storage nodes in Dynamo. And if there's a failure, if it detects a failure, it's auto admin's job to go figure out how to repair this. And the way it does that is by enlisting another storage node to uh, uh, take over that partition. And so what we'll do is we'll copy the B tree from the, one of the sto uh, existing storage nodes. Clearly, we can't go to the gray one because for whatever reason, it's down. So we go to one of the, uh, the other storage nodes. We start copying that B tree to the uh, new destination. We copy the replication log. Then we make sure that the replication log is applied to the B tree. And once that process is done, the new node is essentially caught up with the leader. And it, it actually is even eligible, eligible to become the leader of the partition. And so this is just an example of one of the things that our auto admin does. I wanted to talk a little bit about secondary indexes. So let's go back to the same table that we were talking about a little while ago. And now let's just, uh, build a secondary index on the name attributes for our items. So the process is very similar to a, a regular base table. And that is we take the, uh, the attribute that we're going to build the secondary index on. We do the hash on it. We sort it and then uh, send it to different partitions. So again, uh, the top, the purple partition is going, maybe it's split at 0, 8 or 0, 8, 0, 0 hex, something like that. But one, a key point here is that the secondary indexes don't have the same partitioning scheme, the same number of partitions. They're actually independent of what happened with the base table, um, which sometimes is, is uh, a little confusing. But now what happens when you update that secondary index, the process for the base table is exactly what we had described before, but now we have to get the uh, index partitions updated. And we do that with this process, uh, an independent process called the log propagator. And what the log propagator is doing is watching the replication log on the storage nodes and taking, it ha it's aware of the schema for your table, what things are the secondary index. And it uh, executes a put essentially like the request router would do for the base table and it sends that, uh, that update to the index partition. But it can be a little bit more complicated than that. If you update an item, say the customer chain said, you know, uh, we had our customer Bob, and Bob wants to be known as Robert, um, we would do an update to the base table to change that attribute from Bob to Robert. Well, what would happen is we would remove Bob from someplace in the old index, and rewrite that index someplace else. So this points out that you can get amplification of your writes to your secondary indexes, even though you're only doing one put to the table. And it can get worse than that. We allow you to have, right now, up to five global secondary indexes. So a single put to a base table can end up hitting uh, 11 different storage nodes um, or 11 different partitions, and ultimately 33 different storage nodes can be involved in that single update to a put. So I mentioned auto admin, and auto admin is kind of, I don't know, magic isn't the right word, it's the heart of DynamoDB. It's the piece that, that you know, we call it the DBA for Dynamo. Its job is doing things like the repair that we talked about, creating tables. It does table provisioning. Um, it is involved in splitting partitions when it, they need to be uh, split. Lots of other things, rebooting servers. It's essentially our DBA. Like, and, and the kind of the design principle that we have is that if a human had to do something to Dynamo, we need to get auto admin to do it because humans cannot manage a system at the scale of Dynamo. So, yeah, auto admin. Cool. Let's move on and talk a little bit about uh, provisioning table capacity. This is um, probably all of your favorite point uh, part of Dynamo. When we build a table, 
there's really, there's only two things we ever ask you that you have to give us. One is the table name, and two is what is the primary key for that table. But you can also have us or specify the read capacity unit and the write capacity units for your table. That's essentially how many reads are you allowed to, going to do per second. So a read capacity unit is, is not just a single item read, it actually is based on the size of your item. So one RCU will allow you to read up to 4K of a 4K object. If your object is uh, 20K, to read that item, you will need five RCUs uh, in that second to do the read. And the same is true for writes. So the thing about provisioning, though, is that this is a, a really hard problem for you guys. And we know that. Because you know, your goal is, or desire is to pay as little for Dynamo as possible. And so you want that provisioning number as low as possible. But if you set it too low and your traffic changes in any, uh, any way at all, you're going to get throttled. And depending on whether, it's, there are applications that, that are fine that with being throttled. There are not that many of them, but they don't care. Um, but for the most part, people really do care. They want to get to the data that's sitting in DynamoDB, so they end up over-provisioning their tables. And like I said, this is a hard trade-off. And what I wanted to do today is walk through uh, an example where, um, where we talk about some of the improvements and how these improvements are made for provisioning in Dynamo. So this example is going to go through, we're going to, because write RC or WR, WCUs are completely analogous to read uh, RCUs, we're just going to look at the read side of the equation. The, the, everything that we're talking about would be identical on the right side, but we can just ignore it for this example. So we go back to our table, and we have this table provisioned for 300 RCUs. So what Dynamo will do is split that up uh, among the partitions, and each partition will get 100 uh, RCUs to, to read the data. And the way we implement these RCUs is by a fairly classic algorithm called a, a token bucket, or a token bucket algorithm. And the way these token buckets work is they have a fill rate. And in Dynamo, the fill rate is the RCUs. So in our example, we're giving it 100 tokens per second is how many we add to the bucket. And we take one token out for each read operation that you do, modulo the size of the object that I was talking about a moment ago. If there are no tokens in the bucket, when your read comes in, we actually respond with a throttle. So this token bucket has a capacity of 300 times your RCU. And the reason that we choose 300 is that gives you five minutes of tokens available. So if you're if you do not do a read against your table for five minutes, we will actually, you will bank 300x your RCU in tokens. If you don't do any reading, and once you get that token bucket full, uh, those tokens just start falling on the floor. So it'll max out, in our example, at 30,000 tokens, but again, it's uh, 300 times whatever your provisioned RCUs are. What's cool about this is that we allow you to burst into this capacity. So if a spike in traffic comes in, for, you will have essentially five minutes worth of tokens to uh, execute these gets against. Now, Dynamo can't actually, a, a storage node can't actually support 30,000 uh, requests within a second. We, we wouldn't be able to handle that. But if you say spread those 30,000 requests over uh, about 20, 30 seconds, we will honor that and we will uh, let your traffic burst to, to, to uh, accommodate that, that increase in temporary spike increase in load. Um, but if you have sustained traffic, like let's say uh, Bob here is some uh, busy customer. Or I don't know, we're doing lots of lookups against Bob. And our RCUs become unbalanced in, uh, on that particular partition. What'll happen is uh, 
Eventually, if that load is sustained, bursting will no longer help us because the token bucket is only getting refilled at 100 tokens per second. <coughs> so if, uh, if the load re stays at 150 per second, 50 of those are going to end up getting throttled. Again, not such a cool thing to have happen, especially given that you actually still have 75 RCUs on the table in aggregate that you could be using, but we're throttling you because you have a hot partition. So what do we do here? But a couple of years ago, we introduced this thing called adaptive capacity. And, and what adaptive capacity does is it changes how quickly your token bucket is getting filled. <clears throat> if we could fill the token bucket at 150 tokens per second, we would be able to sustain the load that we were, that we were just seeing um, and have no throttling. And the way we do this is by uh, this thing we call the adaptive capacity multiplier. And that multiplier is just a number that we multiply by your RCUs and change the fill rate of that bucket, the token bucket. So here we're showing the token bucket is now getting filled at 150 uh, tokens per second. Now this multiplier is actually applied to every partition in uh, on your table. And so, uh, oh, going back to our picture here, so at this rate, we, we, um, even though each partition is provisioned at 100 RCU, we will let that traffic go through at 150 RCU. So how do we do this? Well, we use this thing called PID controller. Um, so PID controllers are you know, super common in industrial design for controlling you know, lots of different processes. The PID stands for proportional, uh, integrated, differentiated, feedback, something, something, something. I'll just call it a PID controller. Um, and it, but what it's doing is a PID controller is trying to control a process and, and set a value such that the feedback loop meets, makes it so that the system is in some kind of equilibrium. And what we do with this PID controller is we give it several inputs. We give it your consumed capacity, how much is this table using in aggregate? What is your provision capacity on the table? What is the throttle rate? And because it's a PID controller, it needs to know about the, the current value to compute the new value. And then its output is a new multiplier for this table. And then we take that and we apply it to all the partitions in your table, and that will uh, adaptively change the capacity, the provisioning on your table. So you guys are probably thinking, hey, I can game this, right? You know, okay, each partition is now getting 150 uh, RCUs. That's 150 over what I'm paying for at 300 RCU. So this condition will last for a little while. But what will happen is uh, our PID controller will notice that your consumed capacity is above your provision capacity, and that multiplier will go back down to one. And in a little while, if your capacity or your load stays identical, we will each, each partition will get 100 RCU, and each of them will get throttled 50. We're back to throttling. Uh, so this isn't so cool. But at least we're giving you what you're paying for. Right, so what do we do here? Well, last year we launched this thing called auto scaling. And this is the next solution in the problem. So when you set up your table, you can set up um, auto scaling. And we'll ask you some questions about what you want, how you want auto scaling to work. So the, you can set a lower bound on your capacity and an upper bound and some target utilization. 70 is usually a pretty good number for this. If you know your load is actually really flat and doesn't have a lot of variance in it, you can set your target utilization much higher. If you know that your load is really spiky, you might want to set that utilization a little bit lower. But we can set this utilization, and the reason that we have to ask you this is now we're changing the provisioning of your table, and we're going to change the amount of money that you get charged from Dynamo by changing the provisioning. So you obviously have to opt into this. And we really do encourage you guys to opt into this. I'll show you a graph in a minute of what it did for one of uh, Amazon's internal tables. So 
If we're sitting in that situation where we were at 150 RCUs per table, um, auto scaling will take the provisioning to this table, in this example, to 640 provision. And the reason that it's 640 is 70% of 640 is 450, our consumed capacity is 450, so it'll end up setting our provision capacity to 640. So how does this auto scaling thing work? Well, hopefully most of you know um, or, and have looked at your CloudWatch graphs for the tables that you have, um, because Dynamo is publishing these metrics to CloudWatch. And so the, the metrics are sent to CloudWatch, and AWS has a service called AWS Auto Scaling. And what that does is it sets alarms on, on uh, certain values that are sitting in CloudWatch. So auto scaling actually sets two alarms per table, technically four. But again, we're just talking about the read side of the equation, writes are symmetrical. It sets two alarms, one for your provisioned value and one for the target consumed value. And if you go in uh, and look at your uh, auto scaling console, you can actually see these uh, provisioned alarms. The reason it sets two is clearly the consumed one is so that it can change the value. The reason it sets a, a, a alarm on the provisioned is if you go through the API or the console and change the provisioning, that's the way that auto scaling learns that you changed it. Otherwise, you could, uh, it wouldn't be able to adjust the ratios correctly. The other thing that auto scaling will do is it, if your load goes down, maybe it's the middle of the night and now we're running at 10, uh, RCUs per partition, auto scaling will scale your table down. And in this case, it, we're actually consuming 30, so we need uh, about 43 provisioned IOPS to have our utilization at 70%. Here's this graph I was talking about. This is um, some Amazon internal tables. And you can see what the auto scaling has done and how nicely it actually follows the curve. Um, you know, at one point there on, you know, around 9.30 or so, we actually got really quite close. Um, and had the load been a lot spikier, maybe we would have suffered a little bit of throttling. But I, I'm really amazed and pleased at how well auto scaling tracks the uh, provisioning of the table or the consumed capacity of the table. You know, a little quick recap about provisioning. When Dynamo launched, we, Dynamo, expected you to have a very, very balanced workload, um, each partition getting essentially the same amount of work and over a, the same period of time. But, you know, we, we noticed or heard from our customers and understood that there's this problem with the imbalance of load over time. You know, it might be the top of the hour and you're going to run some report and you make a bunch of queries against Dynamo. You're, you're, uh, Request rate is imbalanced in time. And so we built bursting to help solve that one. Um, you can have imbalance in your key space. In my example, I said, hey, Bob was a really hot customer. Um, that partition was getting a lot of load because of the imbalance in our key, key space. So we did adaptive capacity to solve that. You know, uh, our workloads change over time. You know, hopefully our, our systems grow and get bigger and we, get more adoption. Um, and as that changing workload happens, we built auto scaling to solve that. And you know, I think we're going to have to continue to iterate on this because, like I said, we understand that this is one of the pain points of, of using Dynamo. Next, I want to talk about Backup Restore and how we've implemented Backup Restore. So back, Dynamo has two kinds of backup restore. We have a point in time recovery where you can specify a point within the last 35 days when you want your table restored to. Or we can take on-demand backups and you can restore them at some point in time in the future. Where would you durably store backup data? They wouldn't, this is, this is a little bit of, um, bureaucracy here. I'm not allowed to say S3. I told you I worked on S3 when I started out. I have to say, the first time I use this, Amazon Simple Storage Service. I don't think anybody knows that it's called that. It's S3, right? We store our data in S3. Dynamo does the same thing. 
And what we do is we move those replication logs to S3. So we aggregate some amount of data, um, essentially as a file, and we upload that to S3. Before, before we delete it off the storage node, we make sure that we've uploaded it into S3. Now, we don't actually upload three copies of the data. We'll see what the storage nodes will look at what their peers have done. And if their peers have already uploaded it, we won't upload it again. But we upload that data to S3. Now, these boxes on the right kind of represent the different logs for each partition. And if you'll notice, there is no coordination about when these uh, logs are uploaded. The, the storage nodes make independent choices about when they want to uh, upload their data. So if their disks are fill, starting to fill up or whatever, they can just say, ah, oh, yeah, I can make disk space. I'll, I'll upload some logs so I can delete them. It also periodically uploads a scan of the B tree. Now, I say snapshot of the B tree because it's not a snapshot in the classic sense. What we're doing is we're scanning that B tree, getting all the data out of it, and that scan takes time. So the, the, the actual upload of the B tree is not a consistent view of, of your Dynamo uh, partition. And so, kind of over time, you'll see that, you know, just periodically, uh, Dynamo will decide, I'm going to take a new snapshot of this partition. And again, these things are not coordinated among the partitions. So later on, if you want to restore, you, ch you pick a time that you need to restore your table at. The first thing that Dynamo does is it looks at all the artifacts that it's stored in S3 for that table and says, these are the pieces that I need to restore this table. So it finds some snapshot in the past and then all the logs from when the snapshot started, whatever log was active at that point, through the, any logs up and past the time of the point of, of restore. And it then will make up partitions. In this case, it would make three partitions in the new table for you, apply those snapshots, and then or restore the snapshots, and then apply the logs to those snapshots. If you choose a, a point in time restore, not that you would even know that there's a snapshot being taken at this point in time, but if it does happen that it's a snapshot being taken well, at the report, restore point, we still can't use that snapshot because it doesn't have the consistent view. And, but if you do choose one afterwards, we can use that snapshot and then we don't need that stuff in the past. That's a little bit about how we do point in time recovery. But it gets a little bit more complicated. So Dynamo will split your partitions. If the data in a partition gets too large, auto admin will decide that, hey, that partition needs to be split. And it will, in this case, we're showing the green partition. It's going to get split. And now if you choose to do a restore at some point in time, um, we have a slightly more complicated problem to solve. And that is, how do we restore this light green partition? Well, they're both rooted in the snapshot, that dark green snapshot, but now they have separate key spaces. So when we do the restore, we will take the whatever key range the partition split that. That will get restored onto the first partition. We'll use the keys from the snapshot of the higher part of the range for the light green restore partition, and then apply the logs from there. Um, On-demand backups. So on-demand backups are kind of similar to point-in-time um, point restores for us. Clearly, functionally, they're very different for you. But what, it, what a point or an on-demand backup is, it's essentially like we want to do a point-in-time recovery at right now, at the instant that you ask for the on-demand backup. Now, the problem here is that we don't necessarily, we, we're not going to have the logs that we need in S3 for this backup. But we're going to have pretty much everything, almost everything up to it. So one of the very first things that we do as soon as you tell us that you want to take an on-demand backup is we have to go tell the storage nodes, upload your logs up through this, the current point in time. And now we have all the data that we need to do the re, uh, a restore sitting in S3. And so like in this backup, of this massive 59-byte table I made for this demo, um, you can see that my backup has become available. And it becomes available once those logs are up inside of S3. And now we could go restore it to a new table if we so chose. So 
Some of you might have noticed that, or you, first of all, you might be surprised to find that we're moving all this data to S3 all the time, right? And we don't charge for that data. Except if you turn Pitter on, <coughs> excuse me, we start charging for it. And why is that? Well, because these snapshots um, and the, the logs are kind of our insurance policy, but we get to control when we take snapshots, when we delete logs. So we're always optimizing it to take the, uh, to do the on-demand backup right now. And so without Pitter enabled, if we take this snapshot here, as soon as that snapshot is complete, we can go back and we can look at all the artifacts that are sitting in S3 before that, and we can delete them. Because we know we're never going to need them. We have a current snapshot. But when you turn Pitter on, from the time that you turn Pitter on, we start a clock and we say, OK, for this table, we have to keep all these artifacts through the in, into the past so that we can do Pitter at any point in time that you guys request us to do a restore. So now when we take that snapshot, we have to maintain this data for at least 35 days, the Pitter window that we offer. And the reality is, is that these snapshots sometimes are substantially older than that. We have to keep them around because it's co more cost effective for us to hold, you know, if you're not making a lot of changes to your table, the logs don't grow very fast. So we might keep that snapshot around for a lot longer period of time and have uh, more time worth of logs to apply, even though it might uh, data-wise not be a lot. So that kind of explains why we, how we do, are doing the, the billing for Pitter. Um, I wanted to move on to Dynamo Streams. We'll just touch on this a little bit. Um, so Dynamo DB Streams is a way of getting all the mutations against your table. So we are every put, update, and delete, anything that changes the table. Um, one of the cool things about Dynamo Streams is there are no duplicates in the stream. Um, and we'll uh, tell you why that's, I think that's important in a moment. Um, they're in order. Now, there's an, I put a parenthesis around that, by key. Every mutation in the stream will guarantee for a, key, for a particular key to always happen in the order that you executed those operations against a key. But they may not be uh, in the order that, that they were happening against multiple keys because the partitions aren't actually operating in sync. But a key will always be in the same partition, and the partition ordering will always be maintained. Um, the other thing that I think is cool about this is we give you the new and the old uh, um, image, item image in, the, in these records. So the way DynamoDB Streams works is it's really riding on top of essentially the same technology that Amazon Kinesis is built on top of. So a lot of the concepts in Kinesis, if you're familiar with Kinesis, are the same as they are for DynamoDB streams. We have the concept of a shard. They have a concept of a shard. You actually use the Kinesis client library to talk to DynamoDB streams. I'll have an architecture picture in a moment here. So we have things like records and checkpointing and so on, because this is riding on that same technology. But what we do differently is you need the uh, DynamoDB Streams Kinesis Adapter. So the KCL talks to that intermediate layer and then talks down to streams. So the API looks from the read side is identical to a Kinesis stream, but clearly we don't let you put into your DynamoDB stream. The way the stream is written is from the storage node. So the storage node is applying these to a shard. So the, in, uh, each stream is composed of many different shards, but a shard is an in-order um, list of those mutations, and it's the storage node that is writing those to the, uh, to the shard. And again, this is asynchronous. You know, if, if that subsystem is having issues, the leader of the store, that partition storage node will know what was committed into the Dynamo stream and what wasn't, and we'll catch up a little bit later. Our typical latencies here are on the order of tens of milliseconds for that data to get through the stream, or into the stream. I don't need the laser. Um, 
And finally, the last thing I wanted to talk about was a little bit about global tables. So global tables we launched last year, I think, at reInvent. Um, and the idea here is that you can get a system of tables in multiple regions to all work together and have uh, the same data in them. So I've set up a, a small global table here with, in three different regions. Um, and, uh, oh, I gotta go back. I wanted to point out one thing. So one of the things that, that's interesting about global tables is you have to, there's an IM role uh, associated for global tables. Global tables, for the most part, is operating as a uh, external service to Dynamo, for the most part. So you have to have, we have to have permission to write into your table. It's not like the request router. The request router has got direct access to a storage node. Global tables is going through request routers and it needs to pass the same uh, authentication checks that any other user was. And that's why we have this service role for DynamoDB replication. So when we propagate this data from, uh, from one region to the other, we have the, we're essentially building a stream reader uh, in the source region. And that reader is, is just consuming all the mutations and shipping them over to DynamoDB in the second region. But global tables is multi-master, so we actually have to go in the other direction as well. So in the other region, we will have um, a stream reader that's looking at the mutations. Now, this is kind of like uh, the snake eating its tail, right? I mutate it here, it goes into the stream, it's gonna go to the other side, that makes a mutation there, that's gonna go into the stream, it's gonna come back around. Well, it doesn't quite happen that way and we'll touch a little bit on why, why we don't get into the circular loop. Global tables is also multi-region, and we have multi-region replication. So when that stream reader reads that data, it actually has to um, um, ship it not only to one region, but any of the regions that, are belo that belong to that global table. And so, uh, you know, with three regions, you have all these stream readers, and you quickly get this complicated connected mesh uh, where every stream reader is talking to all the other uh, different regions. So this is kind of the high-level architecture of what's going on. Now, like I said, for the moment, you could, you guys could build global tables yourselves relatively easily, if you guarantee that your table only has one partition, so that there's only one shard, and your regions are fixed, and so on. But to really build global tables, it gets a lot, lot more complicated. And so this is actually the, the real architecture for how global tables work. So we don't really have a stream reader, we have this thing we call it rep out, the replication out engine. And it is consuming from the stream's API just like any other application would. But the problem or the complexity for global tables comes in is when your partitions split, uh, streams will have more shards in it. And we have to guarantee that we have a rep out process so reading the data from every shard of your streams. And, it, and so the way that is happening is we have some, some metadata from our control plane. The REPL admin is watching uh, what's happening with the partitions. And it, when it sees that a new partition comes along, we enqueue a piece of work into uh, this SQS queue. And it, some, that piece of work simply says, hey, there's a shard over here, and you need to start replicating it. One of the processes in the rep out will read that off and say, oh, I need to do some more work. I will pick up doing the work here. And this essentially feedback loop continues on so that we have a rep out reading from every shard of every global table um, stream. And then because uh, the streams API is actually a batch API, rep out doesn't talk directly to, to the request routers in the other region. It talks to a process we call rep in in the destination region, and that process rep in is the one that drives the, the request router locally. And when the batch is done, then we'll tell the, the rep out, and the rep out will know that it can checkpoint the stream that that data has been uh, properly replicated. Um, so here's a, a little example where I made a, a really small table and I put one value in it. I said the key is key and the value is value. 
And if you do this in the console on, the, on a global table, this is what you'll see. Um, there's, but as soon as I hit refresh, I get these other three values. This is that very same table, and you know, within, if you refresh within less than a second, it, these three values will show up. And what has happened here is rep out has read the item from the stream and says, oh, here's a piece of data that the customer has added to the table or mutated either way, and, and it, but it doesn't have any of this replication metadata on it. So that's a signal to the rep out process that this data needs to be sent to the other regions. So it adds the source region that it came from. So I was doing this from US East or West too. Um, and it gives a timestamp of when this item was uh, mutated. Now, it looks like we're recording this as milliseconds, uh, but because it's got six digits after the decimal. In reality, what it's doing is it's keeping it accurate to the millisecond, and those three-digit counters are how many events happened in that millisecond. And that means that allows us to guarantee that a uh, partition that the timestamp for each partition is always unique because we reset the counter every time the millisecond clicks. We start from one again. So if you do a, tech, if you if you could do over a thousand operations per second on a partition, which is the limit for a partition, um, that counter would roll over. But it it doesn't. It can't. So uh, we set this up update time. You'll see that this deleting flag is set to false. It's not really important why that why that is false. Um, I mean, actually, that's a misstatement. It is hugely important why that is false. Um, but you will never see it true, because it only is set true during the time that rep out is trying to delete the, the item. And so it's a very, very transient state. Most of the time, it'll be false. Um, the way Global Tables does conflict resolution, if you mutate the same item in two different regions at the same time, we do last writer wins. Um, and again, we have this down to millisecond timing with the, that additional counter at the end. Um, it is conceivable that you could make it happen and those two timestamps would be uh, identical. Uh, I believe the region is then used to disambiguate and one of them is guaranteed to win over the other one. But essentially, it's last writer wins is the thing that gives, you, uh, gives us the uh, conflict resolution. So today I've covered um, a bunch of things. Like I said, if, you know, this is, these are uh, hopefully things that are helpful for you guys in um, understanding how Dynamo works and maybe leveraging Dynamo better for you in the future. So we've talked about the, the get and put, auto scaling the provisioning. I hope that helps a lot. Um, and how global tables works. There's a whole bunch of things that we didn't cover that are things like fleet management, metering, monitoring, capacity planning. And like I said, these are, this is a talk that we would typically give to onboarding new engineers to Dynamo. They would clearly need to learn how this stuff works, especially if that's the area that they're going to work in. But I don't think it's going to be really helpful for you guys to understand how this works in Dynamo. Um, you know, and the next step, if you were developers on Dynamo, the next step we would be doing right now is we'd start digging into code. And we'd say, hey, if you go work on, on auto admin, here's the code base, start reading it. Um, and with that, um, I think to thank you for your time. Thank you.